reducing the stress on the shuttle as it goes transonic. That's why we've invited you, because we think you're a very interesting person with a lot of perspective, and we thought, let's go get Scott. I feel equally fascinated about you guys. Cool, man. So, so with that, because we're going to edit this somehow to make it interesting <laughs> in terms of a, a start. Um, yeah. Let's start with that. Tell us about the journey of Scott Gravel. Oh, journey of Scott. Um, grew up without a lot of attention. Kind of ended up creating fascinating worlds for myself. I built everything I could out of anything I could get my hands on. Lego, wood, sticks. Built a hang glider out of poplar trees and a tarp when I was in some string when I was 11. Um, didn't fly, thank God. <laughs> um, unremarkable student. If they had Ritalin back then, I probably would have been put on it. I played hockey, soccer, football lacrosse never baseball still embarrassing if i try to catch something with a glove you know track running i was just athletic kid yep and i had a lot of i don't know where it's like i guess you could say drive i was telling the story the other day that i excelled at hockey not because i was the best shot not because i was anything but i was the the kid that during wind sprints wouldn't stop going, even if he was puking over the boards. I think back to, you know, you'll remember this, the uh, was it Canadian fitness testing. Totally you know, remember that. that. Yeah, yeah. The badges, the badges, right. I always got, <laughs> I, I always got excellent because I would just, just drive. Um, never the best at anything, but just never quit trying. Left high school, didn't get a full advanced diploma because I couldn't get math 30. Then went to work. You know, I, I went to work as a janitor in the hospital. And I went from janitor to assistant to the perfusionist in the OR, the UVA hospital, very, very quickly, like period of about a year and a bit. Then I realized I was at the top of the pay scale for untrained help in the healthcare system and, you know, 19 years old. And I'm like, well, I should probably rethink things because I'm only going to get cost of living increases now for the rest of my life. <laughs> With lousy grades, I, uh, I had met a uh, physician's assistant. Back then, when you got bypass surgery, they opened you right up. You know, now they go through your, they go through your crotch or the catheter to do most of their work. But, Back then, a bypass was literally taking veins out of your legs and by, bypassing over the blockages in your heart. And uh, there, were, you needed three surgeons to do that operation. And two of them were, were doctors, and one of them was a physician's assistant. He was still a surgeon, but he wasn't a doctor. And I thought, hey, that's cool. It's kind of like building things. <laughs> and so I wanted to go do that. And he said, there's two ways. Go become a medic in the Army. And then go do two years of college or go become a nurse, surgical nurse, and then go do two years of college. Well, the army was going to pay me and nursing school wouldn't let me in. So I went and joined the army. And uh, How old were you? I had my 20th birthday sitting on the floor in Cornwallis, Nova Scotia for basic training. Wow. And no one knew it was my birthday because the last thing you want to do on your first two days of basic training is single yourself out in any way, shape, or form. So I did that. I was on the aptitude testing. I scored fairly high. Um, so they decided to send me for second language training. So I was in the military for a year and a half, but I spent a year of it in St. Jean's to Richelieu doing six hours a day of French immersion because they wanted me to be bilingual. So I was stationed at language school, but I did some stuff with the, the field dam unit in Val Carche. Um, but most of my on-the-job training was just scraping warts and swabbing all my friends for STIs. Um, 
That's, but I have, I have assisted in enough vasectomies that I think I could do one myself if needed. Do one. Yeah. Good to know. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> File so, that away. It, it, you know what? You thought it was a skill set you might need it, but I haven't used it really since I got out. Um, but I could probably if I needed to. So I actually got laid off of the army. How does one get laid off from the army? Uh, budget cuts and the federal government. Um, the thing was called the FRP, the Force Reduction Plan, where okay. they wanted to go from about 92,000 in the Canadian Armed Forces to about 80. And because I was a support trade and I wasn't fully finished all of my training because I went for language training for a year, um, they didn't need me anymore in their projections. So they offered me a bunch of other jobs to stay in the military. But like some hard Navy stuff like Bozen or Radar Op or Sonar Op or stuff like that. The one I yeah. almost considered was a poet. It was a spec two job. So you would have got paid really, really well. But a performance oriented electronics technician. They were the people that would do all the work on the avionics on the CF-18s. If you think where Canada keeps its jets... Those aren't fun places to hang out. No. And I still wanted to be a physician's assistant. So I took a package from the army, got out. They gave me 6,000 bucks towards school and six months of paid leave at the end of my contract. And um, so I went back to Edmonton. And the one thing the military taught me, besides how to polish boots and iron, which I don't do either of anymore, um, is a new way to learn. I struggled in the school and I was 61 average, I think. Um, my teachers couldn't understand how I could get kind of big concepts, but couldn't regurgitate all the material. So when I, I, had, I discovered a new way to learn, which is a lot more self-guided. And then I needed to upgrade my marks to go to nursing school because that, that was you now if I'm going to be a medic, I had to go be a nurse. And um, one of the prouder moments really in my life is math 30. I couldn't get, I tried it three times, three times. Couldn't figure it out failed it. And then the fourth time I just did correspondence course. And I hired my old math teacher to tutor me. Mm -hmm. I had 10 weeks to do math 30 to get ready for the exam, study it, learn it. No coursework anymore. I'm an adult student. I can just challenge the the departmental exam and whatever that is, is my grade. So my teacher was like, Scott, you still have enough time. Like I've got a year to teach this and kids don't get it. And I'm like, well, we got to try. So he would introduce, he'd answer any questions that I had from the previous chapter. And then he'd introduce the new chapter and I saw him twice a week. So we're doing two chapters a week. You get through the entire curriculum. And I was doing all the work with the correspondence program at home. And he never saw my work. He didn't have time for that. So I remember he came up to me before my exam and he put his arm around me and goes, I know you tried really hard. But there just wasn't enough time. And I said, okay. So I go write the exam and then we use our scrap paper. We write down all our answers and he had written the test at the same time. So you have a chance to kind of pre-compare before you get the final results. And I'm going through and he had on the wall, I'm going through and checking my stuff and he get to the end and I'm just like, fuck. And he comes up and he goes, Scott, I know you tried so hard. He goes, no, no, you don't get it. He's like, what? I said, if I hadn't made this addition error and this long answer question, it would have got 100%. From failing math 33 times, trying it and failing it three times, uh, to getting 98% on the departmental exam. That was a pivoting point for me in realizing that the way I'm necessarily I was taught isn't necessarily the best way for me to learn. Right. And um, so I upgraded, I challenged my bio 30 departmental. I challenged French 30 because I just finished doing a year of French immersion, six hours a day. And I challenged math 30. And that raised my average from a, a 61 to an 84. And that got me into university, came to mm-hmm. Calgary, study nursing. And um, nursing was cool and all that, but it, um, 
I got a really unique perspective of what women probably experience every day of their careers. Um, nursing is one of the few women dominated professions. And the women that pursue master's degrees and PhD in nursing um, in their profession um, are highly motivated. Now, if you're a man that goes into nursing, you're highly motivated. If you're a woman that goes into nursing, there might be a chance that just it's a good job for a woman. You know, like some people just go, hey, what would be a good job? So it was an interesting dynamic. And I did experience a fair bit of kind of prejudice or sexism. Like being told when I'm, you know, having to do a rotation in labor and delivery that I don't belong there. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. From, from the ward nurses themselves or from, yeah. from who in particular? Nurse, yeah, nurses themselves. Interesting. And I, I go, well, this isn't the area of specialty I'm interested in. I want to be a surgical nurse, but I do have to do this as part of my education. So I appreciate all the support you can give me. And what year was this, Scott? This would have been 90-something? Um, yeah, early early 90s. 80, 90, 91. Okay. 90, in there. Yeah, yeah. So when I finished nursing, they, at the same time, the Alberta government had done all the budget cuts in healthcare and then closed down all the hospitals. So I never actually worked as a nurse because when I was done with the program, I had to compete with nurses with up to seven years experience. So I went back to what I knew. And uh, at the same time, I had met my daughter's mother, decided to move to California and down in the U.S., there was nursing jobs, but I found that the amount of insurance, liability insurance you had to carry, and the and the and the way the whole healthcare system is structured down there is very very different than Canada. I wasn't super keen on it, but I found a job back in cabinet making, which I had always done all the way through high school. I found a job back job back in cabinet making, and um, I was making as much if not more money than I would ever as a nurse. I didn't have to carry insurance. I didn't have to work shift work and. The only blood I had to deal with was my own. <laughs> so that, uh, that sent me on a journey away from healthcare and into making things for really the rest of my career. So how long did you live in the U.S.? I was down there for three years. I lived in Capitola right outside of Santa Cruz. I was taught to surf by English, Irish, and Scottish immigrants working in the pre-dot-com like era in Silicon Valley. You know, programmers, developers, just in the pre-dot-com, just yep. before that. Yeah. So I used to, I, the first place I ever went surfing, um, went surfing for the first time on a Thursday, and I got my ass handed to me. I was literally the, the shipwreck person dragging themselves out the beach, coughing and sputtering and throwing up water and passing out with the surf still hitting them. All my friends laughed at me. Um, but it was interesting. I remember this very specifically because it was the very first Discovery Channel Shark Week that started that weekend. I think yep. it was just a weekend. It wasn't a whole week. It was just a weekend. And I learned that um, there's a red triangle the highest concentration of great white sharks in the world, which is Golden Gate Bridge. And where you were. To the, off to the <laughs> Farallon Islands. And then down south to this cool little place called Año Nuevo, yeah. which is an elephant seal colony, which happens to be where my friends took me surfing for the very first time. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, shark, I'm going to get you. Don't worry about it. But I, if anyone looked like an injured seal, it was this guy. Um, so yeah, California was cool. Yeah. California, it was interesting. It was expensive. Um, was down there for a few years. Not a place that would ever want to raise kids. How uh, so? Well, when you hear guns go off a couple times a week, you see, you know, 15-year-olds hanging out with 20-year-olds because they're drinking age there is 21. And they're all, like, getting stoned and misbehaving all the time and the education system wasn't great but the motorcycle ride was sure cool yeah you know yeah 
motorcycle through the redwoods and then up and down the, the, the you know the one on the coast like that's beautiful they make commercials out of it that was cool. i did a trip i did a trip um so i ride bikes as you know i uh when i and i would have been early 20s a friend of mine and i did a trip we met in calgary he was living in winnipeg i was living up here at the time we met in calgary drove to Kelowna, went to a friend's wedding in Kelowna on our bikes which was hilarious and then went down through bc through a soyuz into the top part of washington and basically did the northern part of washington and then all the way down the coast washington oregon into california and that redwood ride mm -hmm. it's crazy that yeah. redwood ri ride is probably of all of the places I've been, the most surreal and beautiful and incredible <clears throat> place to go on a motorcycle. If anyone's never done it, it's it's got to be a bucket list thing to do. Because you, so, I mean, we felt like ants. You felt you feel like an insect. All of a yeah. sudden, you kind of get into the forest, and scale shifts dramatically, and you feel like you're in a on another planet. I, uh, I I did that I did that drive too, not in a motorcycle, but in a. Do you remember the? Uh, I had a 2003 Mazda Speed Protege. I don't know if you're yeah. a car guy too, Scott, but it was uh, it was spicy orange. I was 20, 20 years old, <laughs> 23 years old when I got it after my first job. I did the same drive, and I remember thinking the same thing that that you've probably felt on your motorcycle as well, which is as a, in terms of perspective, we are so small in this vast vast earth. And it was like everywhere you looked, you were just reminded of the fact that you are, you know, in terms of atoms, one, yeah. <laughs> one, one zillionth, zillionth of a particle in this massive earth, but yet somehow connected to everything else in the earth, which was, you know, even though I was enclosed in a vehicle different from a motorcycle, I remember just thinking like being in complete awe of that recognition. It's uh, I had a friend of there as an architect, Pat, and every, and Saturdays I'd pick him up, and we'd ride out of Santa Cruz, up through um, Highway 17, and then get up onto Skyline Boulevard, and then we'd ride Skyline Boulevard, and if you're in music, Arlo Guthrie, Alice's restaurant, mm -hmm. we yep. went to Alice's restaurant for brunch every Saturday. And then we dropped down through Highway 84, down through La Honda, which still had an original stagecoach stand in it. Mm -hmm. And we'd hit the coastal highway, we'd ride the dunes and the cliffs back into Santa Cruz. And this is something I think, I think people from all over the world would just come to sort of do that ride. Because it was Redwoods, top of the ridge, ocean front, and it was amazing. And there wasn't a straight road anywhere. <laughs> um, it was really, really cool. That was the one thing that was cool about California was the motorcycle riding. And yeah. um, living in Calgary and having a motorcycle, <laughs> you know, um, but that was cool, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful place. And the work I did down there was amazing. I was building high-end interiors in Pebble Beach on 17 mile drive. So like top, top of this kind of art form of, of, of cabinet millwork that I did when I was down there. And that was super cool. Like I built some really, really neat stuff. We yeah. worked for an entire year. We were one of two contractors um, doing millwork in this house. Um, it was a summer home for the old CEO of Texas Instruments. Hmm. 14,000 square foot hotel with a private wing, really, when your backyard is the third fairway of Pebble Beach Golf Course. Yeah, it was some incredible work. Have you uh, seen the um, the Pam and Tommy show that's been out lately? No, I you haven't. Heard about this? Yeah, I've heard about it. I can't get there yet, though. I can't it's remember. Funny. Around. You're, yeah. you're talking about high end high end carpentry, high end cabinet work in California for really wealthy people. Seth Rogen plays a carpenter. Okay. In in the oh, show, the guy that stole did. the guy that stole yeah, the video. Stole yeah. the tape. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. thinking about you. There's you in California, like Seth Rogen. And this like it was set back in the same time frame, like back yeah. in the 90s. There's yeah. so was it you? Was no. it you, Scott? No, no one, no <laughs> one lived in the house that I was working, the houses I was working on. Yeah. They were all complete. They they called them renovations, but they only had to leave a six-foot section of original wall and foundation. And then they built something completely new. Wow. Uh, yeah, the, that, that project, like, you don't see work like that here because no one, 
no one spends that kind of money on their house. And that was just a unique place. So. You know, what's funny about that is, is I'm going to take us off on a bit of a tangent maybe, and then we'll come back. Please. Like it's, I mean, that's the beauty of markets, you know? And I think a lot of folks that live where we live don't appreciate that there are markets outside of the, what you're used to here. If you haven't been places and traveled and seen different things where in certain places there is demand for a product like that. Oh, because yeah. people people see massive value in it and they appreciate the craftsmanship and they they well, want something that's that unique and they I'll want ar- something I'll that's argue fun. I'll argue with that they just want to keep up with the Joneses. Well, and that and that's always part of it. Yeah, you, and, and is, yeah. isn't it a bit of, is, isn't it a bit of a scaling thing too? Like if you spend five hundred thousand dollars on a house, it's hard to justify fifty thousand dollars worth of carpentry. But if I spend fifty million. Like I might, I might, I might put 1.5 in, into my woodwork. Yeah. Yeah. But, but here's the thing though, that I think, I mean, I agree. It's not just because I like design and I'm doing it from a benevolent perspective, but the thing I find interesting about this is if you go back in history and you think about some of what are now iconic structures, iconic, whether those are buildings or achievements, <laughs> you know, like look at the pyramids. I mean, that's just a big ego trip for some, you know, really powerful, rich Egyptian guys. Yep. And, and the cool thing is thousands of years later, you, we get to benefit looking at all that stuff. So there's a funny thing in that, right? Because in on the one hand, you think the motivation might be completely off, but because of the inherent beauty in it and structure in it, it actually creates kind of value, societal value over time. It's kind of an interesting well, thing. Let's let, I'm going to take this on another tangent. This is going to get deep and interesting now. The idea of pyramid building. Okay. So pyramid building is to create a legacy and a memorial to your life where you, A, a control the narrative and it, it out, outlives you by thousands of years. Right. Okay. Although the house I worked on in, in uh, Pebble Beach was framed in redwood, so the bugs aren't going to eat it right away. It's still a wood frame structure. It's not going to last. Mm-hmm. Like a couple hundred years, maybe, but not thousands of years. You look at how many people want to build pyramids for themselves. Let's throw a, a couple around. I was at the Getty Museum mm-hmm. in LA. That guy was an asshole. But everyone that goes and sees this monument to his legacy has no idea and just thinks he's a massive supporter of the arts. <laughs> Bill Gates became the richest man in the world and that wasn't enough. So then I've got to go cure every major human disease. Um, we don't build pyramids out of stone anymore. You know, we, we try to create a narrative after we're gone. You know, and if you're, you're that rich, that driven, we can argue maybe that is cure because that's what drives you generally <laughs> that you want to create yep. a legacy, a legacy for yourself. And so we can say the big fancy houses are about keeping up the Joneses and, and impressing the friends that you run with. Right. Cause it is all relative. It is about market. Like what impresses someone here in Calgary, you want to have something slightly better than, you know, the, your, your guy next to you, a little bit better spot on the lake, a little bit nicer wake boat, you know, a little, a little bit nicer labor, maybe a little bit nicer pool table. Like it, it is all relative. And if you live in different markets, if you're on 17 mile drive, you got money. <clears throat> it's probably not new money. It's probably old money. Yep. You know, and uh, to fit in there and you can talk about the beauty. I will challenge that. I have seen some of the ugliest shit put into rich people's houses. Um, you think can't about buy my, style, right? You yeah, can't buy, you can't, you can't buy taste, you can't buy style. I think yeah. about the way Michael Jackson decorated. He had a lot of expensive stuff. But, <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, so it's interesting, though, that we do so much. We push ourselves so much to elevate ourselves from a market or a community or a peer group. But once you get to a certain point, you've got to now elevate yourself beyond your death, beyond time. And this is where the pyramids really came from. How do you get remembered forever? Right. And we can talk about its contribution to a society. Um, 
But if you look at the, the pyramids of the Inca and the Aztec, those were lost for generations. Yeah. So they didn't really stay relative until they were rediscovered. Yeah, no. And I mean, look, in, in all of this, you can think about the good and the bad. I mean, think about how the pyramids got constructed and who constructed them and the conditions well, upon which a, you know, a population of people were enslaved to basically go and, you know, build the monument. Time, the time out. Time out. You're wrong. Okay. They were all paid. How am I wrong on that one? They were all paid. You had a massive labor force there that couldn't work the agriculture industry um, when the floods happened in the Nile Delta. And so every year they would go there and they were paid to build the pyramids. Although we can think about, you know, all of the movies we saw growing up, it wasn't slave labor that built the pyramids. It was a way that the, the state supported the population at a time where they couldn't do anything um, to, to regroup a lot of the funds. I'll, I'll I don't send know, you, man. I'll send, you the link. I'll, send you, I'll send you the link. It wasn't, it I wasn't, it wasn't whips and slaves. No, but well, yeah, but, what, what, but that, then we get into a whole conversation about what is slavery because it, is it only whips and slaves? So example, modern, you could, you could argue modern day Egypt, one place in the world that you might think about as modern day Egypt is Dubai. And I don't know if, if you've ever been, but I've been, and I was yeah. there, I was there early 2000s. So before, like, um, before some of what is there now was really, really built in, but like there was okay. a lot already. And even to this day, it was like, well, who's building all this stuff? Oh, now this is and a different what condition and what conditions. So yeah, they're getting paid too. Yeah. But but what conditions under what conditions are they doing the work? Are they treated fairly? Are they being compensated equitably? And some might argue, you know, they are, so and here, some might argue they're not, but you've got to so. really have a conversation about that. Modern slavery, different question. They get there, they end up owing the people that brought them there more money. They can't leave, they can't make money, they're stuck in that loop. So yeah, that's that's absolutely a different conversation. And I, I would say that who's doing the, the foreign workers that are coming to do work that are indentured, they can't get out. There's no way to climb out of the hole that they've been put in. That is modern right. slavery. And I agree with that whole entirely. But I just want to really do this little thing. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't slaves who built the pyramids. We know this because archaeologists have located the remains of a purpose-built village for the thousands of workers who built the famous Giza pyramids nearly 4,500 years ago. Um, 2006, uh, they had stamps and seals and bureaucratic evidence of how the officials kept track of the, the operational feed and house the workers um, and, and then track their payment for payment. So there's evidence that they were brought in to a work camp seasonally um, to build the pyramid funded by the state. Now, keep in mind that they paid taxes on their crops. So in, in essence, I think this is a way of was just buffering, buffering income. And then when they work, work in the fields, they were dragging rocks around. But they, they did go back to the land and farm it when the, when the Nile receded every year. And then ended up paying taxes to the, you know, the pharaoh and king and stuff like that. But I don't think it was captured captured people's whips as much as it was here. Well, how's you and feed you while you can't work your land, and give you something to do to make some money? So, hey, well, I, I I'd love to read the article. You'll have to send I'll, it out. I'll, I'll send you a dozen different. I'll send you a dozen different articles about it. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. But so anyway. um, this idea, but once again, this idea of pyramid building. Okay, so. In the modern world, there's still people trying to build pyramids. Totally. And, and they're doing so off the backs of people that work for them. And not in slavery, but it's kind of this thing that if you own the property and you're paying people a wage to work on your property, and we can say the property is a shares in a, in a company now versus just land, um, that the, whoever the property owner is, is getting rich off of the work of the people that do, even though they're making a wage to do it. They're not benefiting from the full value of their work. And because you have such excess, you can start building pyramids. And uh, look at what's recently happened. Elon Musk buying Twitter. Why the hell does he need Twitter? Because... Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think he needs Twitter. I mean... No, but if you can control the conversation, you get to control history. He who writes the books... 
right? Controls history. Yeah. And I mean, the thing about Elon that's interesting, because people, you know, I mean, the only person that could probably answer this is himself if he's being truthful, like, because everyone's speculating. Is, is he benevolent? Like, is he a guy that really is benevolent? I don't know. I mean, is he, does he really, does he really want to provide a platform for free speech? Like really real free speech or not? I don't know. Or is this, a, or again, is this, is this exactly to your point? Is this another, I will now control the narrative and have in, incredible amounts of power to control outcome the way I see it because I have full, full private control of one of the great media mediums of our modern day. I don't know. So let, let's go back to the people that are so highly motivated to do big, huge things. What is their motivation? Most cases, trauma. Elon Musk has talked about a lot about his trauma growing up. You know, Steve Jobs, you can read a lot about his trauma growing yep. up. You know, Jeff Bezos, you can read a, find out a lot about his trauma. They were all paid. You had a massive labor force there that couldn't work the agriculture industry um, when the floods happened in the Nile Delta. And so every year they would go there and they were paid to build the pyramids. Although we can think about, you know, all of the movies we saw growing up, it wasn't slave labor that built the pyramids. It was a way that the, the state supported the population at a time where they couldn't do anything um, to, to regroup a lot of the funds. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't whips and slaves. No, but well, yeah, but, what, what, but that, then we get into a whole conversation about what is slavery because is it, is it only whips and slaves? So example, modern, you could, you could argue modern day Egypt, one place in the world that you might think about as modern day Egypt is Dubai. And I don't know if, if you've ever been, but I've been, and I was yeah. there, I was there early 2000s. So before, like, um, before some of what is there now was really, really built in, but like there was okay. a lot already. And even to this day, it was like, well, who's building all this stuff? Oh, now this is and a different what conversation. Condition, and what conditions? So yeah, they're getting paid too. Yeah. But, but what conditions, under what conditions are they doing the work? Are they treated fairly? Are they being compensated equitably? And some might argue, you know, they are, so and here, some might argue they're not. But you've got to so. really have a conversation about that. Modern slavery, different question. They get there, they end up owing the people that brought them there more money. They can't leave, they can't make money, they're stuck in that loop. So yeah, that's that's absolutely a different conversation. And I, I would say that who's doing the, the foreign workers that are coming to do work that are indentured, they can't get out. There's no way to climb out of the hole that they've been put in. That is modern right. slavery. And I agree with that whole entirely. But I just want to really do this little thing. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't slaves who built the pyramids. We know this because archaeologists have located the remains of a purpose-built village for the thousands of workers who built the famous Giza pyramids nearly 4,500 years ago. Um, 2006, uh, they had stamps and seals and bureaucratic evidence of how the officials kept track of the, the operational feed and house the workers um, and, and then track their payment for payment. So there's evidence that they were brought in to a work camp seasonally um, to build the pyramid funded by the state. Now, keep in mind that they paid taxes on their crops. So in, in essence, I think this is a way of was just buffering, buffering income. And then when they work, work in the fields, they were dragging rocks around. But they, they did go back to the land and farm it when the, when the Nile receded every year. And then ended up paying taxes to the, you know, the pharaoh and king and stuff like that. But I don't think it was captured captured people's whips as much as it was here. Well, house you and feed you while you can't work your land, and give you something to do to make some money. So, hey, well, I, I I'd love to read the article. You'll have to send I'll, it out. I'll, I'll send you a dozen different. I'll send you a dozen different articles about it. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. But so um, anyway. this idea, but once again, this idea of pyramid building. Okay, so. In the modern world, there's still people trying to build pyramids. Totally. And, and they're doing so off the backs of people that work for them. And 
not instant slavery, but it's kind of this thing that if you own the property and you're paying people a wage to work on your property, and we can say the property is a shares in a, in a company now versus just land, um, that the whoever the property owner is, is getting rich off of the work of the people that do, the, even though they're making a wage to do it. They're not benefiting from the full value of their work. And because you have such excess, you can start building pyramids. And uh, look at what's recently happened. Elon Musk buying Twitter. Why the hell does he need Twitter? Because... Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think he needs Twitter. I mean... No, but if you can control the conversation, this... you get to control history. He who writes the books, right, controls history. Yeah. And I mean, the thing about Elon that's interesting, because people, you know, I mean, the only person that could probably answer this is himself if he's being truthful, like, because everyone's speculating. Is, is he benevolent? Like, is he a guy that really is benevolent? I don't know. I mean... Is he, does he really, does he really want to provide a platform for free speech? Like really real free speech or not? I don't know. Or, or is this, a, or again, is this, is this exactly to your point? Is this another, I will now control the narrative and have in, incredible amounts of power to control outcome the way I see it, because I have full, full private control of one of the great media mediums of our modern day i don't know so let, let's go back to the people that are so highly motivated to do big huge things what is their motivation most cases trauma elon musk has talked about a lot about his trauma growing up you know steve jobs you can read a lot about his trauma growing yep. up. you know jeff bezos you can read find out a lot about his trauma growing up um even uh, bill gates do you think the root of that is 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 never being good enough and always wanting to be good enough and wanting to worthy be yeah be worthy of praise from someone that you maybe didn't get be, it from be worthy of being alive yeah you like you that, that that's then the root of what maybe we would describe as the ego required to want to do big things and leave the drive, the drive, the insatiable drive that it takes to do this because in the pursuit of success, we, we have an argument, we have a conversation around what that actually is, but, or everyone has a different definition, but the pursuit of success, once you've reached a milestone and you still don't fill, fill that hole, you go looking for the next milestone. Yeah. The next milestone. Next yeah, milestone. but I think, but I think what history's taught for people is, if you don't find that somehow within your own person, the stuff will never fill the hole. Because oh, well, agreed, but this is know, why and, we and, end up now building pyramids to make it relevant. Yeah, but I guess what I wonder yep. about is, is um, so again, let's go back to to Elon and Jeff. Okay, sure. Elon bought Twitter. Yeah. And Jeff is building the world's largest sailing yacht and requiring a city in, in the Netherlands to deconstruct a bridge yeah. uh, that's, I forget how old, 150 years old, which he's paying for. Yeah, and that's they'll fine. put it back together. They'll put it back and together. Yeah. Back. And they're going to milk him. I hope they do. They're going to milk him and improve the damn thing and make it really great so he can move his bloody boat. And yeah. so when it comes to... Which is, which, you know, both, both, I bought Twitter, I built the world's largest sailing vessel <laughs> in terms of potential, I mean, it's funny, right? In terms of potential impact to society, Elon, Elon wins, but I guess in that the spectrum is, well, it could be really good and it could be really bad. The fact that Bezos has a giant boat, I mean, I guess if you happen to get in the way of it one day, you, accidentally, you, you, you might, that might affect you. Um, and if you wanted to cross the bridge when it's being dismantled, because now it's going to take an extra 20 minutes to find your way across to wherever that is in the Netherlands, that's a pain in the ass. But it's interesting, right, to think about those motivations, because you're right, they probably come from the same route. I find it fascinating to see how different people channel those energies into different things, right? Like, and, and, why, and why they manifest in some ways this way and in other ways the, another way. I mean, to bring it, it's interesting. So, and Lorenzo may want to talk more about this because he introduced me to this clip a while ago. There's a clip of um, Giannis Atetokounmpo who plays for uh, Milwaukee, right? I mean, this is the MVP. What was it last year, LP? Was the MVP last year? Uh, or the year before. The year before. I think Jokic was last right. year. 
But Lorenzo flipped me a clip, and this is a theme we want to talk to you about, uh, Scott, because it's literally in every conversation we've had so far, we've had this theme come out around humility or, or, or not, right? Mm -hmm. And in this clip, Giannis is being interviewed by somebody, and he basically says, I don't care about the MVP. I don't care about this. Like, I want to be the best basketball player I can be. I want to be a good teammate. I want to develop myself. I want to do all of these things. That's what it takes the, the accolades, whether I win the award or whatever, like, I don't care. It's, it, you know, I mean, I'm grateful to get it, but it's not what I'm, it's not what's motivating me. And, and we had a long, long conversation about this because um, we're probably oriented more that way. Like, let's do good work and try and become a bit more anonymous than be out there because we'd rather just go and do the good work and kind of don't care about that other stuff. And I think part of the reason for that is we're interested in so many things, you know, I'm, I'm going to have no problem retiring and being a happy camper. Cause I've got, you know, 8 billion things I can get interested in. I had a guy once that I, that was on a board with me, but we, we had this conversation over lunch and he sort of said, so what's the plan with your consulting practice? And I said, well, what do you mean? What's the plan? He's like, well, what happens in, 20 years. And I said, well, in 20 years, it probably like when Lorenzo and I are done, we probably <laughs> shut it down. And he said to me, point blank, what about your legacy? Yeah. And I, and I said, what do you mean? And he goes, oh, well, for me, I really want this to outlast me. And I, I, I looked at him across the table and thought, okay, well, a couple things, you know, no disrespect, but like, like legacy for who, who cares? <laughs> but he really was serious. And I, yeah. I found that very, very interesting because, you know, we want to do good work and make an impact on our clients and be able to take care of our families and that kind of thing. But like when we pack it in, I don't care if, you know, it outlasts, like, I don't care. I'm not motivated that way. I, I was in nursing, as you know, and I, I had to do my, my uh, rotation through palliative care. And it was eye-opening being there helping people die. Some of it was, you know, heartwarming. Some of it was just really sad. And um, there was a palliative care nurse in the, in the UK that did some writing. I actually wrote a book. I wish I could remember it right now. But they talked, she interviewed all of her patients for her entire career and talked to them about, like, what are they happy about? What are their regrets? Not a single person said they wish they made more money. <laughs> Not a single person said they wish they worked an extra Saturday. They drove a seven series BMW instead of a five. Was it, it didn't matter. At the end of their life, they all talked about wishing they were or proud they were, you know, uh, Friend, a better friend, husband, partner, neighbor, parent, yep. right? They also wish they would have done the experiential things, climbed the, climbed the mountain, sang the song, wrote the play. Yep. They also wish they would have spent less of their life comparing themselves to others. I think a lot of what we do and what we've talked about so far is how we define success and how we compare ourselves to our peer group. Mm -hmm. Like we, we're looking for that validation that somehow we're doing the right thing, but we're doing all the wrong things because we're focused on making money, making a name for ourselves, creating a legacy and not being a good friend, a good neighbor, a good partner, a good citizen, good human being. Um, and we're also not focused on pursuing the things that we truly enjoy and value and would enrich our lives. Yep. And um, that was influential for me. And uh, people, I think most people that meet me or, or don't understand me. <laughs> um, because you talk about what's your motivation, you know, like I have, I'm so, so goddamn lucky in the situation that I'm in. You know, when you think about work and finance and stuff like that, and I'm very fortunate. I don't give a fuck. You know, I 
I don't have an aspiration to have a private fractional share in a private jet. It is nice sitting in the front of the plane when, when it makes sense, right? That's just more comfortable. But um, I, I spend most of my free time walking around my community with my dog, making sure I know my neighbors. Yeah. When I have a chance to travel, I take it, you know? Um, I've had, you know, the opportunity to kind of upgrade the, my living standard a little bit, but I'm in, sitting in a rental apartment right now. I've got a couple of nice guitars, nothing crazy. You know, I, um, I still drive a, a Ford Flex, <laughs> you know, with 130,000 kilometers on it and everything's falling apart. I'll probably get a vehicle when that one stops working, but it's, it's, it's not about stuff. It's, it's about the, the people and the experiences you have. And I don't know if we all figure that out. It takes a great deal of courage to say, and, and, I, and this might seem so fucking arrogant for me because I'm fortunate enough to make enough money to pay all my bills and have a little bit left over to have some fun with. But it wasn't always that way for me. And so I have a very different perspective on money. You know, money is only something you worry about when you don't have what you need. If you have what you need, then you got to focus on the other things, which are. But I think, but I think this is where I mean, there's an old adage in economics that talks about um, resilient societies or societies that are you know robust are the ones that have a very large middle class. You yeah. know, so again, these are not people that are kind of on, you know, going you know on the bread line. But they're also not the ones that are going out and saying, yeah, I'll go pay cash for the for the Beamer. Yep. They have incomes, they have families, they have yep. jobs, they have a home, yep. but they have to be thoughtful and they get to go and do some things, but they have to make they have enough money for a vacation. And, right. Yeah. And I, and I think I think there's I mean, I, I, like I've talked a lot about this with lots of different people over many, many, many years. And I think part of the problem in our society right now is. In the, in the West, particularly with those that have, is they have to excess, like such excess, and they haven't maintained the perspective of that middle-class mindset. Now, luckily, I think because we all, the three of us live in where we live in the prairies in Canada, right? So, you know, like families that are old families in this part of the world can maybe trace their roots back three, four, maybe generations. And like, if you're a fourth generation yep. Albertan, your, your family that came here was one of the first sort of folks that would have I know, come I know across the name somehow of, and gone, right. I know the name of the boat my great grandparents came on. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and so do I, I mean, like I'm a, I'm a second generation Canadian, well, first slash second, depending on whether you're going on my mom or my dad's side. So you're not that far removed. I think in some other places where you've got more and more and more multi-generational wealth, people get further and further removed. And then they start because they're bored. I think it's two things. It's the trauma and it's boredom. And it's probably lack of having good, good grounding and interest in sort of things that are benevolent and not sort of, you know, the virtue versus vice discussion. They start to seek out weird shit to focus on. And then they wrap it up in all this crazy thing, like even philanthropy, you know, Lorenzo and I've talked before about philanthropy. It's like the guy who is a philanthropist on the condition that you name the wing after me, right? On the condition that- Pyramid building. I the, yeah, I get the statue. I want the naming rights. Yeah. I want the ceremony. I want the award. And then sure, you can have the, you know, the $5 million. And it's like, is that real philanthropy? I don't know. My view on philanthropy is you see the person, you know, the lady with the two kids who, you know, is a single mom at the grocery store. And you say, you know what, today I'd like to pick up your tab for you, ma'am. Like there's charity. And from my perspective, I'll take um, that one level, uh, one level further is you, you pick up the tab and she doesn't even know it was you who picked up the tab. Sure. Even better, even better. Yeah. I think one of the th one of the things that maybe separates us jurisdictionally, us being you know Canada and then North America at large, is when the money came though, right? Like 
if you think about, you know how there's, there's a sort of a pejorative term for people that don't have money and then all of a sudden make money. And as a result of all of a sudden making money, they start to spend it. New, yeah, new money. Yeah. And so when you think about us as a, as a place, like we have new money, like it's a hundred, 150, 200 years old of new money. And I think there's probably a culture here that's just learning how to deal with the new money and is starting to spend it. Because if you think that it's just generation. Well, I think it's, I think it's younger than that, Lorenzo, because everyone that came here was, a, was, a, was agrarian, right? It's and they worked their War ass II. off for two generations yeah. it's probably just to make a living, II. right? And then post that, if you look at where wealth, you know, like excessive wealth has gotten created, it's how long has the energy sector been in Alberta? Right, 85? You know, okay. so there are two generations there. Yeah. And you can tell the difference between the, the guy that started with the, the shovel, the pickup truck and made it made a name for himself and his kids. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with that, because I think Very if, different. You, if you think like Jason, back to your point about the number of generations, like so my, my mom was born in Rotterdam, the place where the, the bridge is coming down. Yep. And, my, and my dad was born in, in Italy, in a small town in Friuli in the northeast side. But they've got generations and generations and generations and generations of folks who still live in those places who have all of the history of going through all of those times, the good times, the down times, the mediocre times. And I think there's built through that a lot more stability, whereas we're still going through, to your point, Scott, two generations of money and sort of learning how to deal with it. I think it's why you see boom boom uh, and bust. It's right. We're still we're still a boom and bust culture. Yeah, totally. We haven't had enough booms and busts because we might still be a hundred years away from going. Maybe we're doing this wrong, but I think it's coming, and I think we're at the early end of that. When I think about sort of the economic picture today in North America, where we're starting to, I think, see folks start to go, Ugh, "We might not, uh, we might not be in the lead anymore." And I think the lead is now coming from you know folks in other jurisdictions, China, India, some of those that are now starting to make the money. Well, and and here's and here's the thing again, which is why this is so fascinating on an individual level, but even societally, right? Like everything dies, everything eventually erodes and fades. Like like Rome was the greatest society on the earth for a period of time, Thousands and now it no longer years. right, and now and now it no longer exists. And people are arguing right now in some of the stuff I'm paying attention to that we're going through a major economic shift. And that the United States and the hegemony it's enjoyed for a variety of years with its dollar as the global reserve currency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is, is maybe not necessarily going to be the case going forward. We're going to be in a bifurcated world with China rising and things like that. And so the hilarious part of all of this, if you have a long enough time horizon, is to realize that. While, you know, like even even folks, I remember when I first moved here, there were folks in this community, you know, they were the people. And now you look at them because they're all a lot older. If I was to mention those names in the same at the same events to now the folks that are there that are the 30 year olds, not those of us that are, you know, in our early 50s, they don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. And they might know. Isn't that the guy that that building's named after again? But they don't have any context. And so the hilarious part of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weave this into a movie um, analogy or movie example. So, and, and the reason I, I bring this up is I used to work for a guy and went into his company when it was, you know, of some level of size, but it wasn't big. And, but we scaled it. We scaled it significantly. And it's continued to scale. And he's now a very wealthy individual, but he's pretty miserable. And I remember thinking about him because he basically said to me at one point, he made a decision when he was younger. And there's a lot of trauma there, Scott, to weave that back, that he wanted to be successful. He wanted to have a business. And he knew that for him to do that, it had to be his singular focus. So he was going to not get married, not have a family. And I I applaud him for that because he didn't, you know, um, pull a bunch of other folks into it. But I remember thinking about how his entire life revolved around the success or failure of this business. And I remember the last scene of the third Godfather where Michael Corleone is now an old man. Okay. Who's been through that journey and has been the Godfather. He's had all of it. 
but he's now in front of a villa, this giant villa in a wheelchair with a blanket on him, sitting there alone. You know, and the backdrop's beautiful. Like that scene, cinematography. Cin mm. cinema, what is it? What's the right? I know word? what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say the wrong thing. It's, yeah. yeah, cinematically. There you go. Yeah. I'm going to edit that part out. <laughs> it's no. beautiful. It's beautiful, right? Like, and it's you. The birds. You can hear the wind. Like it's almost like you're there. And then you see two men walk up behind him slowly, and yeah. one guy pulls out a gun and shoots him in the back of the head. And that's the end of the show. And I always used to think about that as it related to this individual. It's like, okay, you're doing all of this, but at the end of the, your life, what is your legacy? Even if you have naming rights on something, like you're that guy because there's nobody there. You have no family. He didn't really have friends outside of the acquaintances he had through the business. Well, and you couldn't no, trust anybody. No, no, and he was, he was, he was a guy that was fairly um, skeptical of the motivations of the people around him. Uh, fairly constant. A nice way of saying paranoid? Yeah. It's, it's hmm. crazy. Sounds like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a lonely existence. And why? This becomes a quote from why. You're, you're touching on the rise and fall of empires. And, you know, I, I keep trying to learn to stay relevant in my job because my job changes so much, like every day, every week, from what I used to do to what I have to do now. So when I start thinking about the future and thinking about money, um, my tax accountant suggested I read The Psychology of Money, which was fascinating. But I'm reading a book called The Changing World Order by Ray, Ray Dalio right now. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how there's always rises and falls, you know, bear, bear and bull markets. And they, they happen on patterns. And if you, if you grew up existing in one, you can't imagine these other things happening. And depending on what age you grew up in, the struggles that you experience will dictate how you think about the world, how you think about money. And it's, it was fascinating to get all that perspective that in the long term, we spend a third of our time in the world in crisis and two thirds of our time in prosperity. And depends on what level you look at. We're right now coming out of, unfortunately, the longest period of peace in the Western world that had never been achieved before. Yep. We're all so shocked right now at the war in the Ukraine and the tragedy that's happening there right now. But if you look at history, that's human nature. That's as normal throughout time. And we just, well, there's whole generations of people now that have grown up in the longest time of peace and prosperity that human history's ever, ever had. And when you think about this, if, if all of your planning and all of your thinking is based on this limited perspective of, of life and, and of time, that so many people, I'm sure, are getting incredibly surprised as what could or might happen. I think it continues to evolve, right? Yeah, I think, I think, though, what's interesting is I think we've, going back to education, we've lost our, our grip on history. Like it's not taught well in schools. It's not taught well. In there's, you know, there's. Can, there's a can we pause this just for a sec? Yeah. My daughter just landed from Amsterdam. Welcome home. I'm in an interview right now, but I'm glad you're home. How are you feeling? I'm as fast as I thought I would. Okay. And it could be because I am very drugged up. Good. Good. That was the plan. Let me call you back and soon they get to wrap this up. Okay, kid? Okay, love you. Love you. Welcome home. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So, Emma, Emma, Emma yep. Yep. had a wicked ass cold. And she flew back from Amsterdam today. So she got up at about 10 o'clock last night, our time. <laughs> got to the airport, went through all that, nine hours on a plane. Now she's back. So... But for her, it's uh, it's only about ten o'clock at night for her right now. So, does she go? And she go? Is she going back? For, in a week. In a week. Yeah. Okay. In a week. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, no, 
I think it was so. interesting. That's, this is an interesting segue because we talk about culture and we talk about change. Uh, Amsterdam at one point held 70% of all the world's wealth. Mm -hmm. And they were the shit. And they fought everybody for a very long time. And then they lost. Mm -hmm. And Amsterdam, well, a couple hundred years ago, was a pretty dark place. A horrible place to be. But what's fascinating is the culture that has evolved out of it. You think about the drive, we talk about the pyramid builders. There's no pyramid builders in Amsterdam anymore. They just want great quality of life. They want to spend time with their friends and their family. They want to do something productive until five o'clock, then they want to go home. The work-life balance there is amazing. Even the pigeons are chill in Amsterdam. The dogs are chill. They don't have leashes or collars. They just walk around with their people all the time. You know, no one really gets swears or upset at each other. It is so relaxing. But I think it's 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 an interesting level of maturity of a culture that new culture exactly. yeah. don't have. Yeah, well, and it, it comes right back to what we talked about before with not only wealth, but you mentioned we we talked about war. I mean, mm -hmm. and and how long we've had peace in the West. Europe knows war. Oh yeah. Europeans know wartime. They probably have a lot of their parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, you know, people themselves who've been through it. And it's interesting your point about European culture versus Western culture or North American culture in particular. Yeah. I shouldn't say Western because I guess they consider themselves that, but you know, it's much more about, yes, I work, but, you know, um, it's, in, it's in much more balance. And I mean, think about that. So you build the pyramid, you build the big building to yourself. And then guess what? Somebody comes along and decides to drop a bomb on it and blow it up and, or blows up your factory. And overnight, there goes your livelihood. And yep. not only your livelihood, maybe there goes your family, or there goes all of your workers, or there goes all of the above. And now you have nothing. Mm -hmm. And now what do you do? This is why, it's still, this is why it's still, Jason, you, I, I mean, I, I probably bug you every, every year about this. Not, not that you're not on side with this, but um, it drives me nuts that Remembrance Day is just a forgotten day in Canada. There's yeah. zero recognition for it anymore. You know, well, you and I've talked. You and I've talked about that about how much you know. Yeah, like it, most people here, if you if you know you look at eleven o'clock on that day, where we're supposed to take the moment of silence and remember. There's nothing. I mean, I'm in. I'm in my. I'm in my office for this for this recording right now, looking outside, and I can see downtown. I can tell you, for a fact, because I remember it this year, Lorenzo, because we talked about it. I remember. It, I set an alarm, so that I'd be aware of it. And so I paused and I actually stood up and looked near my window. Yeah. Life, life was going on. Life went on. Life went yeah. on just fine. It's not the same in some other places. People yeah. pause and remember. In fact, it's, it's, even, important deep, it's even deeper than that. Going back to the Netherlands and Scott, maybe you'll even know the town given that you're probably, you know, becoming more familiar with them and their culture. Now that your daughter's there, there's a town in the Netherlands that was liberated by Canadian soldiers. And every year they light something like a thousand candles in honor of the fallen soldiers who helped to liberate the town. And I go, well, how the fuck can it be that they're honoring Canadian soldiers more in the Netherlands than we would here in Canada? And we, I think about We've never parts. experienced loss on our doorstep like that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly. Like, we, we, lost, we lost soldiers and young men. Look yep. at what's happening in the Ukraine right now. They're losing you know, children, entire generations of people are dying and being murdered. Whereas you send young men over there, and especially they're young men who didn't have families and stuff like that, they get remembered by a cross here in Calgary on Memorial Drive once a year. You know, every person that came from Calgary that, that, that passed away in the First and Second World War gets, gets stood up, you know, but it's for a week. Um, there's... And I hate, and I'm not discrediting the loss of the lives that were given, but there's a difference when the war is in your backyard and the loss mm -hmm. you experience um, versus the loss of, of, of life of young men that, that Canada and the US have experienced, right? And now young men and women. But in Europe, well, you think about how many Russians died in the Second World War. What was it, eight million? 
with you know and like we put that in perspective to how many canadian soldiers died and i think it was in the you know it was in, i don't even know if there's the tens of thousands in the second world war mm -hmm. you know and then you look at the devastation that happened through bombing right and tanks rolling through and stuff like that we've never experienced that here like they have in europe or the history of war in the middle east or asia you know and culturally it's not a part of who we are we came to broadlands you know dominated suppressed the indigenous people and just started farming whereas over there there's been battles going on for power and control of of everything for millennia it's part of who they are. You talk about old money versus new money. You also exactly. talk about old history versus new history. Yeah, 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 exactly. And if you have a deep, deep history, both you know in your family and, and your place of being, but in also the struggles, that that ends up being part of the narrative. Whereas here in North America, we all came here, you know, our ancestors, you know, three, four, five generations ago, we came here, we're given great opportunity coupled with very hard work you know here this land's yours but you got to clear it you got to plant a crop and you got to get it done right um so there's this hard working modest kind of vibe here but then you got the younger generations that want the excess and we're not tempered by anything historically it's just you know keep climbing up the ladder the higher you go the better you get and there's 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 no preference for loss well, I think it, it's so, another weird thing too. I find here with different people, depending on on um, on sort of where where they come from. Like, so we're very young in this part of the world. A lot of us come from very humble beginnings. You know, mm -hmm. like very humble beginnings. To your point, our like, ancestors not, came here because we couldn't get back home what we could get here, which is usually correct. land ownership, property ownership. Right. 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 So they, so they were, they were poor, right? I mean, the people that came, my grandparents were poor. Um, some people here have maintained a connectivity to their heritage and to those stories. And they're proud of them. I know a lot of people though, who aren't, and they don't want to talk about that. And they want to talk about the new stuff because, you know, I mean, and this is again, back to the boom bust thing. I find it hilarious. If you go back a few years in Calgary, you know, and Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Maseratis, dealerships. And then you go and you look at who's driving them. And these are like 20 year old, 30 year old guys, 40 year old guys. And it's I would like- love, I would love to take you down to the parkade in this building right now because there's a Ferrari and there's a Lamborghini Diablo with this much dust on them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and here's what I don't get, Scott. Parked in a like, mid-priced apartment building because I, you know the date that they got them. They're not insured. They haven't moved, but they're sitting in the basement. Well, and what I, so what I don't understand again, it, I mean, I get it, but I don't get it is people, t people get some money and then they immediately go and buy the stuff. And it's the YOLO oh, culture they, they, and it's they the- get, it's, They get enough money to get the deposit down to finance the stuff. Fair, fair enough. But that's the point is yeah. it's look at me, I can get the thing. Yep. But then but then this is the this is the hilarious, ironic part of it. What you're describing is, yeah, but then the bust happens and now I can't afford my payment or I need to liquidate the vehicle or I need to whatever because I no longer can afford it. And there's- I mean, this is, again, it's like the wisdom of the long term, the wisdom of the perspective back to whether it's the European thing around, hey, look, we've been through all of the wars that preceded what, you know, are the wars in North America we focus on, which are World War I and World War II. But there's a whole bunch of other ones that happened over there well before that time. And yes, I guess in North America, you had the, the battle between the French and English in Canada which a lot of Canadians of our modern generations, their stories in a textbook, they're not anything that anybody has any affinity to from a familiar or friend, friendly connection. And same thing with the American Civil War. I mean, 
you know, we haven't had combat on our lands. We haven't had planes or tanks or guns or bullets or swords or um, armies of centurions or whatever, you know, stomping through and killing everybody. We haven't had that. So there's this lack of wisdom to go, maybe I need to be a little bit more pragmatic. Maybe I should maybe not, maybe I should wait a bit. Maybe I should save for a rainy day. Maybe I should this, do those. This things. becomes this becomes really what's the definition of wealth. And Scott Galloway talks about this in his second book. After he wrote the four, he wrote the algebra of happiness. And he mm -hmm. talked about this guy that has a house in the Hamptons and a private jet and a penthouse apartment downtown New York City. And his total monthly burn is three and a half million dollars. And he scrambles all the time to get it, pieces to make sure it's all paid and covered. Then Scott Galloway talks about his father, whose pension and investments exceeds his expenses. And he says his father is wealthy. Mm -hmm. And the other guy at the house in the Hamptons is poor. Mm -hmm. So this idea, too, of saving for a rainy day versus instant gratification based off of debt mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the ferrari dealerships lender you need um this idea that true wealth is when you have choice um not when you have ming vases it's it's <laughs> like do i want to do this again or do i want to go here or you know be able to leave a, a job or a relationship or a situation that's unhealthy for you is wealthy because if you have the means to do that you're not stuck in, in something bad that's that's wealth um being able to make a decision when you wake up every morning about what you'd like to do versus what you have to do that's that's wealth and the secret to that is not about how much you have it's about how little you need Mm -hmm. right. And then you can focus on experiential things and, you know, and relationships and people right. forget this. They forget that. They think that I'll be happy once I have X and then you get to X and you're like, Oh, I'm not happy. So I guess I need, need X 1.2. Right. And, and then I'm still not happy. And, and, you know, this idea that money, this increases the luxury of your misery becomes very, very true for a lot of people. Driving a Ferrari is, it's, I guess it's, it's kind of like sky jumping. The first time you do it, it's really exhilarating. <laughs> the second time you do it, it's still exhilarating, but not as much. And then eventually it becomes boring. Right? Yep. And then you go looking for the next thrill. Well, if it's not a Ferrari, I need a, a Bugatti Veyron because the Ferrari only goes 340 kilometers an hour and I need to go 500 kilometers. You know, like it's, it's this hamster wheel. What's amazing about that though, Scott, Jason, you and I talked about this three days ago, I think specifically about cars is when we reflect back on the cars that gave us probably the most enjoyment, we usually pick like our first or second car. Yeah. that's usually not the Ferrari, right? It's usually the, no. Corolla, the Honda Prelude. In my case, it was six, this Snapchat Speed Protégé. Robin's Egg Blue 69 Volkswagen Beetle. There you go. Yeah. Mine, mine, was a, mine was the silver first generation 82 Honda Prelude. Nice. A car. And so you think of the irony of that, right? That, you know, yeah. you go and you acquire and you acquire and you one up yourself. And then at some point in life, whenever this happens, and if you're, I guess, one of the three of us, you're fortunate enough that it's obviously happened to us because we look back and go, this ain't worth it because the car that I still dream about in lust over, and I literally dream about my Mazda Speed Protégé, I haven't dreamt about any of the other cars I've owned. I've only dreamt about that one. It's well, it's funny. One you, you see this all the time is now... What are some of the most expensive cars you can buy? They are the cars of the 60-year-old or 65-year-old man who he, the dream car he wanted in high school or the first car he had in high mm -hmm. school. Exactly. Now, resto modded or yeah. authentic matching numbers, and they go for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands because we want to buy that experience back again. Yeah. You know, and... The pursuit of stuff and the pursuit of happiness is pretty empty. You know, um, where it's interesting, though, is 
I can talk about, and I did, when I talked about riding motorcycle in California, I didn't mention the bike I was riding, but, <laughs> but I, I mentioned the road I got to ride. It's now less about the car. It's more about the, the drive and the journey and who you're with for the story that you tell. And the interesting thing is you can do that in any car, any totally. vehicle. Yeah. When you think about a vehicle is you're more likely to have great memories in a small, older house than a big mansion. Right. Because the reason you like, the, you, I think about new feet kitchen parties. Yeah. Right. I think about that kind of stuff. I think about those memories that get created. It's not, it's not the, the, the thing you're doing it in. It's what you're doing and where you're doing, who you're doing it with. And this comes back to, you know, we've been talking a lot about spending money and I, this reminds me of a, um, a quote from Warren Buffett, you know, and granted, he's got a lot of money, but the thing he talks about is what well, there's one thing that you cannot buy, irrespective of how monetarily wealthy you are, and it's time. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is, again, you know, the wisdom that comes with some perspective and reflection is we're doing it right now, we're spending time. The three of us are spending time. We're going to end up spending a couple hours together. And we can't get that time back. It's gone. There is no making, I mean, you know, money, money, you can, you can rebuild wealth, monetary wealth. You cannot rebuild time lost or time, well, time spent time, with people. And so time, if time you, and health, the things that yeah, money can really buy you. Yeah. Right. So you think about that and go, are, you know, Am I spending my time? Am I choosing to spend the time that I do have that is in my control um, the way I want to? And I think to your point about need, Scott, you know, a lot of people, I think, make the false well, belief. Most that people, when, most people when looking I get, back on their life will say they didn't. And a lot of people think when I, you know, it's this, it's the, it's the when I get to when I have a million dollars, when I earn so much, then I can. And, and they, they're, it's like the carrot that's dangled in front of them, right? They're like the greyhounds running around the track, chasing the rabbit. It's like, as soon as I get the rabbit, I can stop running, except guess what? You may never stop running because so, even the wealthy people we talked about earlier in the conversation, in some ways, they're still chasing the rabbit. They're still well, chasing yeah. that rabbit. I did a big deep dive almost two years ago now. I got completely fried. Stress from COVID, financing the company, personal relationship. Like it was, it was a kick in the teeth for me. And recovering from that, I didn't want to just get back to where I was. I'm like, I, I need this oh, difficult event in my life had to have some benefits. So I wanted to make sure that coming out of it, so part of what I did was trying to figure out what's enough. We talk about all of our history, right? We all have this, this European history. So all of our cultures were raised with winter. And I think we've all been thinking that we always need to save for winter because we don't know about what the uncertainty is. We need to create more, we need to create more, right? Acquire things, stuff resources there's other cultures that you think of just hunter gatherers they, they don't really have a lot of possessions they just go get what they need when they need it um and they have kind of less stress about that they have you know they don't even have permanent settlements you're very nomadic but culturally we're always preparing for a bad winter the crops got to be big enough got to store enough food or we're going to starve but winter, at least you know how roughly how long it lasts and a good idea that if your grain bins are full, you'll probably be okay. None of us know how long we're gonna live. None of us know how much is enough. So we keep going to pursue more. So I did an exercise that I found very freeing. It was a little weird. I research everything, as, as you guys know about me. I researched, uh, so Canadian male born in 1971 is expected to have an average lifespan lived to 84, give or take. But 84 is a predicted average of death. So of course you can improve that, less than that, depending on your habits and, and, and genetics. But 
So, okay, okay, I'm 84, I'm on my deathbed. Who's there? What are my regrets? What am I proud of? Wanting to increase the number of things you're proud of, decrease the number. I've got 33 years now to make sure that that date. But I also worked it backwards and go, okay, so what do I need to get to that place that I'd like to be at on my deathbed? Mm -hmm. Resources wise, where should I focus my energies? And depending on what standard at which you want to live at, you can actually pretty well calculate the resources you need, but you also have to put a stake in the stand about the standards at which you want to live at over that period of time. So you can actually come up with a number. Mm -hmm. The question is, once you hit that number, do you stop and <laughs> just do it? That's, that's the magic question. I know my number. I have a pretty good idea when I want to stop. I'm fortunate enough that the standard which I want to live in is lower, thankfully, than hopefully the resources that are available to me. So when I say I don't give a crap about the money, it's like I'm going to be fine. Now it's, it's, it's more about can I impact people's lives, which is one of the things I want to make sure that I don't regret not doing having had the chance on my deathbed. Given a chance to impact people's lives, did I take it or not? So I'm pretty clear on what my motivations are and the, the why. I'm also pretty clear that there is a point where like, that you have enough. And then you're, you are got to shift the focus over from security, like filling up the green bins, you know, to community, relationship, ad adventure, travel, experience, you know, I do want to write some music. I want to take more pictures. I have a lot of other ideas around technology that can be a more direct benefit to society than, than just supply chain automation, you know, and I'd like to work on those things. And I'd like to, that would give me purpose. And then lying on my deathbed, looking back at my life, okay, here's the things I'm proud of. And I outlined it now, which creates a level of clarity versus just a, I don't know if I had enough, so I just need to get more. I don't know if I have enough just to get more. You can actually make a plan for this stuff, but it's weird to think about when you start at, hey, I'm going to die and work your way backwards. Because most people do not like to think about that or accept that, yep. right? Acknowledge it. And I just don't want to die sad i don't want to Which die again what's what's also i mean this is again a theme that has come out in these different conversations we've been having i want to start from where when i'm going to die requires you to have a certain level of ability to feel a bit of discomfort let's say or pain right or or um anxiety or anguish and this is the same reason i think a lot of folks that talk about successful entrepreneurs are, well, have you failed before? Because if you've never experienced any level of failure, it's really hard for you, you know, to, to have the wisdom that comes from, from that. And like, I think that theme, whether we're talking about an entrepreneur or a society or a family or a group of people or a culture, like back to the Europeans, they have, they know what that's like in their culture now to have everything taken away. And, and then realizing it's not the end of the world, you can rebuild and they have rebuilt and they've done it multiple times or the entrepreneur that's gone and started a company and hit the wall and then started another one and hit the wall and started another one. And, and maybe that one did okay or does okay. And maybe it becomes, you know, maybe it becomes Tesla or whatever. Like there's an interesting part in that. And even in this discussion, right, about like, well, I don't want to admit I'm going to die. I won't even go there. I can't think about it. Well, then how are you ever going to have the conversation with yourself that you say you just had to sit down and have enough perspective to go, I really now have clarity about what I need and what I want because I've deliberately let myself be that vulnerable to experience that level of, I don't know what the right word is, discomfort, I guess. I'll use that word. Well, to, I'll, to, to I'll that. argue that this was thing, right. I'll argue that this was all an attempt to avoid a huge amount of discomfort. 
I don't think there's any more discomfort I've ever witnessed than someone realizing they're about to die at their deathbed. <laughs> and and yeah, and that they completely fucked this life up. The interesting part of that is if you've had the conversation with yourself like you have early, you have a chance. You said 33 years. I hope it's longer than that for you and for me. Well, it's just if, if 84 were so to be the average. So, so. But let's assume it's longer. Okay. Yeah. But you, you have now time and, and perspective because you've let yourself think about that to make decisions to, to achieve that. So you won't have the regrets. My argument is those that don't do this, there's, a, there's what, like, look, we're all headed to one destination. That destination is we're going to croak. At some point, we're all going to die. That's the great leveler for all of the people we've even been talking about before. So what I like is folks that are, you know, those that can have these conversations or experiences early, they're, they're actually quite fortunate. And you may not think about that when you're young. I remember, I mean, my first company that I started when I was 28 and we hit the wall, took it public. We hit the wall three years later. And I didn't have this kind of perspective back then. And it hit me hard. Like I went into a depression um, because I thought it was all my fault. And, you know, it took all that on and everything like that. And it was an awful experience, but there was a lot of wisdom that came out of that now um, that has allowed me to go on and do other things, but I had to go through it. Okay. And I've often said, I've said this to Lorenzo over the years that I've known him. I've said this to friends, family, in some ways, I'm really glad because had I not experienced that, and let's say it would have been really successful. And I mean, I would have had significant success at, let's say, 30 years of age. I didn't have the maturity to be a responsible, wealthy 30. I would have been an idiot, right? I would have been the guy that's buying the Ferrari and getting the big house and building the pyramids because I wouldn't have known any better. And I would have had a giant bloody ego and I would have been this arrogant prick. I know I would have been. And then I would have been even more vulnerable for, for the fall that would inevitably come. Cause I think inevitably it comes for everybody. And maybe that time for some of those is on the deathbed, but it comes and man, oh man, the higher up that ego mountain you go, when you finally fall off of it, you know, God hopes that people have the mercy that it's not that far a fall, because if it is one of those giant ones, it's going to be really uncomfortable. Well, what you just described for people's journey is also one that we've talked about around societies. Yeah, exactly. When it's only been upside and positive and everything, then we don't have the generational history to recover from, from falling like the Europeans have and do, right? So I'm not afraid to fall because I'm not a attached to how high I got up the mountain because I'm not saying how high up the ground is defining my worth. What's, what's defining my worth is I was willing to try to climb the mountain and what I learned climbing it and what I learned falling, you know, the knees, you know, the, the scars, the scars that heal and make you stronger. Um, the goal isn't just to get to the top of the mountain and stand there and say, now I'm at the top. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the top of a mountain is no one can stand on the top of a mountain for very, very long. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, and if you are one of those people that that um, that thinks like that, like, oh, look at me, I went to the top of the mountain. Guess what? There's going to be somebody at the top who wants to push you off. They're going to be waiting for you when you get there. Or, or, or the wind, or the weather, or like you yeah. can't stand on the top of a mountain for very, very long. I had a chance yeah. to sit down and, and and have beers with someone who climbed Everest twice. And I asked him, why did you climb it twice? <laughs> and it's basically because it was, it was there to climb and he didn't get the satisfaction out of climbing it the first time, you know? And um, I would rather have climbed to base camp with a great group of people and shared that story than stood on a mountain top by myself yeah. mm -hmm. any day. I'll applaud the person who makes that important that wants to go to the top of the mountain. And, but I would rather go on a journey with people that I admire, care about, and share that journey. Because like we talked about, is 
the, the, the drive is more the drive, especially the road trips. If you think about some of your best drives ever, it doesn't even matter. Like the best drive I ever had was in a suburban with no back seats in it. Mm -hmm. My buddy's buddy's vehicle on an epic road trip. And that is the least performing car, the least fun car to drive, <laughs> well, least comfortable vehicles at old suburban, you know. Um, but that was that was a great trip. And uh so I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to create opportunity, invest in, in people, things, and ideas. And I'm, I'm glad about that. I don't have, don't tell my investors, but I've, I've done a lot of work to heal with my childhood trauma. So I don't right. need to go build a massive pyramid, but if I can make a difference in, in, in the world and people's lives, I know on my deathbed, I will regret not not having taken the chance to do that and none of that has to deal with money or cars or private jets and, uh, I, I think what's interesting about that scott and going back to jason's earlier uh analogy to that from the um interview clip from Giannis uh and to Decumpo, the milwaukee bucks player is and i was thinking about this around goal setting like instead of setting goals around outcomes you set goals around some of the things you mentioned the activities that help you get there the outcome is secondary the outcome will or will not happen. It's actually out of your control. What's in your control is the activities to get there. And so the outcome almost becomes irrelevant and you should be indifferent to it. Um, there's sort of a saying in stoic philosophy that all you can control is the drawing back of the bow. Once you let go, it will go where it's going to go. But that part's out of your control. You've done everything you need to prepare for that moment, but the minute you release it, it's over. And that's sort of, I think, you know, I'm hoping that things work out for all of us in ways that, you know, we feel fulfilled, but ultimately it really is only about what we try to do, you know, day to day that might ultimately lead to, you know, an outcome that's desirable. Let me point out something you just said I found interesting given this conversation. The fact we're convert having this conversation means that those outcomes in, in essence are already achieved. It's already happening. It's not, it's not something that tomorrow or one day, or if I get there, like, got to take a moment to recognize that we're here having this conversation. We're having this conversation we got to, because we got to know each other, like each other, respect each other, right? And we've, we've connected on many, many things professionally and personally leading up to this conversation. You know, you know, we're friends. Yeah. There is success in that already. Yeah. That is well, and, and it speaks to aim. It speaks to purpose and objective. I mean, what's the purpose yeah. and the objective? And I think to Lorenzo's point, my observation across a variety of different disciplines, whether it's a sports team or a business or what have you is, of course you have a purpose and objective of, you know, trying to achieve whatever the, 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 the win, the win, the aim is, but how you go about doing that, right? How, how you bring yourself to play the game, who you do it with your level, your level of, personal and team excellence in terms of how you apply yourself to that is ultimately much more important and much more determinant of the potential and probability of success versus, you know, saying I'm going to win the Stanley cup or we're going to make, you know, a billion dollars or whatever. And, and that's the issue is we live too much in a society today that is outcome oriented and they're not purpose oriented in terms of, you know, the, I will pull the bow back to use Lorenzo's analogy. I will learn how to do that smoothly. I will learn to control my breathing. I will learn to focus my aim so that it is as true as it can be. So that when I let go and I release the bolt, it has a higher probability of hitting the target, but there's no guarantee to that. And I think today too many people are looking for, the guarantee and the and the focus is then on the shortcuts perhaps because they don't want to put in the work right mm -hmm. because the work's hard so you know you talked about puking scott when you were playing hockey or that sort of a thing and you know people this and this i'm going to sort of tie this back into leadership because i what one thing we haven't talked about which i think we should talk about a bit is antibiotics and your and your vision and journey, you know, into antibiotics from all the things you've done and what you're trying to do with it. But it'd be fun to talk about that because I think people also see this in leaders or coaches is how authentic is that purpose? 
And how much do you rally the team around those principles and fundamentals of excellence and, and effort and things like that? Because ultimately, people, people will see through the facade of those that want to just get the shortcut done. And unfortunately, I think we live in a time where that, those authentic leaders are hard to find. I think they're really, really hard to find. Um, they're there, they're out there, but you've got to search for them. And that doesn't even mean necessarily they have to be the CEO or the C-suite person. They can be in the organization. But I think we need to start to have more conversations like this, which is partly why we're doing what we're doing with this. Let's tease out some of the essence and elements of these, these thoughts to just get people to even open up their eyes and have a conversation about it. Because I think people will be better off by exposing themselves to those ideas and that thinking and having the conversations for themselves around their own, their own tables, their own teams. Leadership is not something I understand or I think I'm good at. It's something I strive every day to learn more about. Um, you hear about natural born leaders. I'm, I'm not one. I spent way too much time playing with Lego by myself to figure out how to lead. Um, one thing I do know is that with like-minded people, my enthusiasm can be contagious. And that allows them to maybe go lead and, and participate and, and do, hmm. right? Now, there's a bunch of different ways to lead. Generally, is you find aligned people that share a similar vision and they want to follow the person that's got the most confidence or the best ideas or the most experience. You think of military leadership, right? We're fighting for a country, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for our ideals, our religion. Historically is what most wars were fought over. Those are big ideas that you can align a lot of people behind. And, um, I don't see myself as a leader as much as I see that I owe a debt to everybody that's working hard on this vision to make sure that the vision is thought through, validated, not a exercise in futility, not a, I don't know what it is, just a dream. Because if everyone's going to put this amount of time and effort into something, that something has to have opportunity, has to have a chance of being real we're gonna go climb the mountain together you know gotta gotta make sure that there's something there to climb and which direction we should go so aligning people is hard because not everyone sees the world in a similar way they don't we don't all value the same things at the scale of a business versus you do as a society or a culture, right? We can talk about how we all value freedom. You know, I'll talk about how we, we value, you know, the ability to define our own destiny, you know, choice. Um, but not everyone will, will value stock options. Not everyone will, will value cash comp, not everyone will value time flexibility, not everyone will value, you know, creating something new and different. Um, some people will value those things incredibly highly and some, some people don't. So I think the important part is in, in creating success is creating all the right people that at least are aligned on values and share a similar vision and want to work together to create it. And then you owe it to everybody else to to get the people that don't share that same vision from dragging the rest of them down. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing I've learned in this whole, whole journey is not everybody can or should be on the whole journey together. And that it, sucks. That it sucks. Does, it, it does suck, but it's true because it, back to sports, it's ultimately up to the, the team leadership, you know, GM coach to put a strategy together and a philosophy about how they're going to approach that particular game that season. And then players have to respond. And those that can't operate in a system like that 
the worst thing those folks can do is keep them on the team because you're going to screw up chemistry. And it, it is hard because you're talking about people. And this gets and you really could have, tough. You could have the best single player that if it doesn't mesh with the team or you don't share at least a common thread on what is the best strategy to achieve the goals, then you, you end up all of this and that effort gets wasted. And well, we see, we're, seeing that this year. we're seeing that this year, Lorenzo and I were talking about this the other day, like we're into NBA playoffs. Both he and I used to play ball in high school. We, you know, we're big fans of the sport and you look at some of the teams in this first round that have gone out and I'll single out the Brooklyn Nets that have arguably, according to today's standards, two of the top five, top 10 players in the world. Kevin Durant, right, is one of those people. Kyrie Irving is one of the other people. They lost. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's, it's again, it's, you've got two great individuals, but you have, to put a, you have to put a machine on the court, right? You have to put it something that has all the parts working together. And even if you have the best, you know, turbocharger, if the engine can't actually can't consume, you know, what that will bring to it, then you're going to blow the engine up. And so and that, and that's really, really tough. It's, and it's, you know, it's, it's a lot simpler in some ways in sports, you, you'd think, but I think in a lot of times, it's why we like to use sports analogies sometimes in business, it's the same thing. You know, you've got, you've got a, a leadership team across an organization. It's the same thing. Like, has everyone got a good, does everyone understand, A, do they understand the game plan? Are they committed to playing that? And do, will they play their role? Because I think that's the other thing that happens sometimes with these great players is back to again, pyramid building. Their ego will not permit them to play a role where they maybe aren't the one that always has the ball, always is taking the, the, the clutch shot, always is so, supposed to be the savior, you know, in the fourth quarter. And those prima donna folks, especially the way the game's evolved now, where you have um, a lot more movement on that particular court, you've got big people playing now. I mean, it used to be John Stockton, you know, Carl Malone dumped the ball into Malone and let him go up because he was so big, he dominated the key. That's not the game anymore. And so it requires a different philosophy. So, I mean, the leadership's got to come up with that and establish it, but then it's got to put a group of people on the thing. And I think, again, it's, I remember a, a um, colleague of mine said to me once, it was great advice. She said to me, the second best answer is no. And I remember thinking about that going, huh, I was quite young when she told me this. And it was basically this point like, well, you might not like it, but guess what? If it's not a yes, the second best answer is no, not the maybe, not the we'll see tomorrow. Let's drag this out. Maybe it's time to think about Let it. Let me think about yeah. it. You know, it's like, no, just, just cut to the chase. Like, it's a no, you know, you're not working out or, you know, no to the supplier. It's I'm sorry, what you're offering isn't going to fit us today. And I'm thank you for your time. And I appreciate the presentation, but this isn't for me. And I never forgot that because I thought it was really wise, you know, because some people, again, they want to avoid the pain of the difficult conversation. And they think they, they, they falsely think they might be doing somebody a favor. And you hear lots of stories of people who think it's the end of the world. And then they go off and find their true passion. And they say, the best thing that ever happened to me was, you know, Jason laid me off. And I went off and, you know, created this brand new thing that I'm super excited about. He did me a favor. So. Yeah, it's, it's team dynamics. And it's, it's been interesting. Like we started with the eight, 10 people. And it's pretty easy for eight to 10 people to sit around and talk and dream and evolve the vision and share that energy. We're 330 people now. It's impossible to do that. So now the messaging has to become more, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for here. It's no longer conversational. It has to become cultural and it has to become a little more abstract. 
the human beings have a great ability to rally around abstract thought. You know, money is an abstract thought. Country is an abstract thought. You know, God is an abstract thought. I'm sorry if I offended anybody with that, but it's it's this idea that you know you can give you can give a chimpanzee a thousand dollar bill or you can give him a banana. He's going to take the banana every damn time because the other thing is just a piece of paper. You know, the abstract thought is the value you put to that piece of paper. So as the organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's like you got I'm, I'm no longer about kicking ideas around and getting things excited. It's about creating these abstract concepts to, to have the company rally around. And those concepts are about the opportunity to make a difference, the opportunity to make change, the opportunity to improve not only your lives, but the lives of anyone that interacts with what we're trying to build. I know that sounds really, really kind of maybe grandiose for a guy who's building robots for warehouses. Um, but we're building, you know, robots for warehouses because those robots can change and the lives of people, the, the unit economics of business, the impact on the environment. Um, and it's, it's a tool to get to a destination. So rather than early on talking about the excitement of a technology about making the robot work, now it's talking about the bigger why. Why is it important that we make this work? It's it's because the the opportunity to you know put a dent in the world, a positive dent in the world. It's not in a sense of pyramid building, but if you're lying back on your deathbed looking at your life, to say that you did something new and different that bettered at least somebody's life, even a single individual's life, mm-hmm. made something better. Um, you know, in our case, you know, when I talk about antibiotics, it was. The asper, aspirational goal for us is to decrease, decrease the, the, the impact that modern commerce has on the environment. And the fascinating thing about that is if we can decrease that impact, we're decreasing jet fuel, diesel fuel, gasoline, mm-hmm. hardboard, mm-hmm. right? Um, real estate, like the amount of real estate needed for modern commerce supply chain. But we're also democratizing supply chain, which allows the mom and pop shop to compete at the same level as the big box retailers. Um, so when there's a democrati- democratization of, in essence, infrastructure that supports everybody and in mm-hmm. doing so supports the environment and the unit economics, that's something as an abstract thought, the opportunity of doing that is now a lot more interesting than creating the PID motion control loop that makes sure the pick arm, you know, doesn't skip a bin across it. Which was fascinating when we were some nerds sitting around and just trying to make it work is just making it work was mission enough. But now to align more people on a broader mission that have a, a more diverse set of perspectives on what value is, I think we can all align that doing, improving unit economics, you know, the, the democratization of choice in, in, in retail, um, the saving of, you know, carbon in modern commerce supply chain, um, all has value, no matter where you're at. So when you talk about leadership, it's, it's for me, it's about being able to share this story and everyone finding what their place is and contributing to creating it. And that is a different journey than it was five and a half years ago when I just had a weird idea for a robot that I thought might work. And yeah, I totally. Think, so that, that's been a journey for me in an evolution. I still don't know how best to do this. But all I know is I don't want anybody on this team that, that doesn't want to be part of that journey and that story. Yeah, I think what's um, what's cool about that is you you also have a situation. This goes back, Jason, to your point about roles and, and role players. Is in an ideal situation, folks would want to define themselves into roles that they know ultimately will help achieve the vision that has been set forth, and do so to the best of their ability. So there's you know in athletics you've got players. Let's say Draymond Green with the Golden State Warriors. 
who recognizes he's not going to score 25 points a game. He's not supposed to score 25 points a game, even though he maybe could if he wanted to become, you know, to show more of his offensive prowess than he does. But he's recognized that he's got a role within the system that makes sense and that if he does that role better than anyone else, that that team will win and then they win. And so I think from, you know, from, I think speaking for both of us, Jason, from our experience, working with organizations where those players recognize the roles and look to excel to the best of their abilities within those roles, given that there's a construct built around that, that they can go, I see what happens when I do this role and I do it well. That's when you've got a high functioning organization. Some organizations require you to actually demand that folks play a role and stick in it. And those ones don't typically do as well because folks have a harder time with um, not volunteering to take on, you know, the task as opposed to being told to take on the task. Well, I think it's a marrying, it's a marrying of two different perspectives. Well, perspectives are are sort of ideas. And, And let me get into that a little bit. Like what you're talking about, Scott, in a very compelling way was purpose, right? This is the why of what we're trying to do. And it's a why that's meaningful. It's not about making a bunch of money. It's not like, it's about making an impact, a positive change in the world. Okay. You need that. And we see organizations that don't have that well-defined. And then there's no, there's no compass. There's no, like, what's the point, right? People go, what's the point? Because you know, again, it's the, so what? And they can't see themselves in that. So, you know, that's not, it's not inspirational. The other side of it is what I'll call is sort of technical competence. Like the people playing the game have to have a certain level of technical competence. So back to sports, like if you've never played basketball and you're on the team and you don't know what a dribble is, well, that's, that's probably an issue, right? Um, Or if you've, You know, if you've been brought on to be an offensive weapon and you can't shoot, like that's a problem. So there's that. And I think what we see is, you know, the ultimate is strong purpose, guiding principles, you know, values, all that stuff and significant technical competence. And that's, again, the pulling the the, drawing the bow back and, and then whatever the outcome. Sometimes you've got greatness there and you still don't achieve, you know, what people determine to be success because you know maybe you don't go public or maybe you didn't make a billion bucks but whatever but we sometimes see you've got two camps it's the a bunch of technicians with no purpose and so they they get into the you know criticizing each other on technique without realizing because there is no then differentiation of roles either everyone's criticizing everybody else because there's been no organization or purpose to say, yeah, but we need these things to be successful or the opposite, which is great purpose, great vision, great, all that. And no appreciation for how important the other side is, you know, and just, ah, oh, we just need to get some people in that. Eh, it's just good. Nah, it's great. They're going to be, ah, eh, we're going to like, but we're going to will ourselves to get there. And the magic is when you, the magic is when you can marry up both. Netflix. So that's, Netflix, I think right now is full of documentaries on entrepreneurs that tried to will themselves to get there. Yeah, right. It, well, it is. And hilarious, right? And <laughs> I think the other thing, though, I want to come back to leadership a bit, because you, you said earlier that you don't think you're a good leader. And I want to read you, I want to read you a quote, because I, diff- I would argue with you that you are on this basis. Um, and it comes out of the actual the remake of the Dune movie that was out last year. And there's a scene where Oscar Isaac's character is speaking to his son and they're, they're, they're sort of overseeing this field of ancestors sort of thing. And he's talking about the son eventually kind of maybe taking over for him. And the kid's kind of like, meh. And he says this, he says, a great man doesn't seek to lead. He's called to it. And he answers. And I think that's the other, there's real wisdom in that real depth. Cause I think you've also got people in organizations that it's like, I got to be the next vice president. I'm, or I'm going to be the chief, whatever. Like I'm that person. I've been here the longest. That promotion should be mine. It should be mine. And in Mm -hmm. our experience, and I mean, even through this discussion, I think, I don't think you're, you're seeking to lead. I think you were called to do something because you had a great idea and you got some people together and you answered that call. And you're that guy. Like you've got the humility and perspective to probably think that way. Lots of people don't. 
and to their to their detriment because those that ha think they have a entitlement to be the leader or are seeking it just to seek it out of hubris be careful I, i've had this conversation with a number of you know people on my team that want to understand how how to grow the career and be in leadership positions I said, leadership is not something you're given. It's something you demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't seem to understand like, well, I can't be a leader unless I'm a manager. No, you, you can be a leader in whatever you do. Within the group of people you do it with, leadership is not about a role or a responsibility. And they think, they think it's leadership that, that if someone gives it to them now, they're a leader. Again, it's hard to drive home that no, it's, you can lead in anything and everything that you do every day. And then it's kind of like, I want to see that in people. And those are the people that I want to see move into a league. Cause that's a different skill set. Mm -hmm. Being technically great is very different than being good with managing people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're two very different things. And, but they're both things you can work on. They're both things you can develop. Um, but I, I find people focus on their technical skills because it's a little bit more objective than they do on their people skills because that's very subjective. Um, I also know that like, I'm not the right flavor for everybody. And I know that what's important to me is I surround myself, the people close to me, understand me and can work with me maybe not a layer removed from me would necessarily be able to easily understand but it's important that they understand their people and can work with their people because you can't be all things to all people at all times and i am not everyone's favorite flavor of kool-aid and i get that um but my role now is to work closely with the team that's around me and deliver on a vision and a strategy to get to that top of the mountain and just make sure that everyone that's joining on this journey, A, wants to go to that mountain with us and B, has the right footwear and at least a certain amount of cardiovascular fitness. Otherwise, it's going to be a horrific journey for all of us. Um, so we talk about skill set. Like you, you don't always have to be the best. You just have to be in it together. And the, the people that are in it together with no stars are often the ones that win. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's my hope. And is that I can get enough people that want to be in this to go make a difference and are in it with me. And when I say to win, go in it to go, go make a difference. And however the chips fall and how the money falls at the end of it, we're all going to be okay. You, know? you see that a lot in music, you know, you think about, I think about bands like, um, well, I'll pick on ACDC for a second, ir irrespective of how uh, competent Angus is playing guitar. But if you think about that band and their formula, right? Like it's the same riff, the same rhythms, but people like it. It's popular. Are they the best technical musicians out there? No, but somehow they put together over a long, long, long career songs oh. and albums that people like and so you you, you know, know music you know music a lot and this is fascinating because i was just studying on this about a week and a half ago that there are chord progressions that match like human brain waves yep and the beat yep is so when yep. i heard when i heard that if you rock a baby at 70 beats per minute <laughs> it won't settle if you rock it at 90 beats per minute, it won't settle. But if you rock it at 80 beats per minute, that kid will fall asleep. So, I, so an, an anecdote for you on that one, and I don't know if it's because of my musical background or what, but my, um, my family has always referred to me as the baby whisperer. And I even did this with kids, like friends' kids when all of us had younger kids. If there was a kid in the room that couldn't fall asleep, <laughs> Inevitably, they said, give, give the baby to Jason, he'll get it to sleep. Yeah. And I, I would hold, you know, he'd hold them when they're really little. And I yeah. used to rock them and I would pat on their back. And I don't know, I, I've never actually timed myself. I'll have to do this after. But I will, I will almost guarantee you it's pretty close to 80 beats per minute. Yeah. 
And, and it's just one of those things, but you're right. I mean, there's, there's, but, th and this is the hilarious thing. So again, like it, it is about pulling together. I mean, this is about organizations, you know, you, you, you there's lots of examples of this. Um, some of the teams playing in, in, you know, in the NBA or in the NHL right now, because playoffs are going on in both of those two professional sports. You can think about this in terms of musical groups that again, are they technically the best musicians? Are they technically, even the way the songs have been produced? I, I watched something recently about the Rolling Stones and they talked about, um, it was actually a documentary on drumming that's on Netflix right now. If you haven't seen I, it, I, what it's I called. watched it. It was brilliant. Wasn't it good? It was amazing. Yeah. Yes. But that whole thing where they're talking about Charlie Watts playing, and I think they're, it was maybe Honky Tonk Woman was the song they're talking about and how that song speeds up through the whole thing so you know it starts out at whatever it is you know 90 you know beats per minute and it ends up way faster no one cares the thing's amazing the thing's a phenomenal song the way it was put together and usually drummers are criticized for this i remember when i used to play in my bands you know guys would want to play with a click track because they didn't want to deviate but the problem with that was it was too mechanical there's no feeling to it. And, and back to organizations, what you're talking about, about people on the journey is, yes, they have to be able to, you know, it's like, hey, I want to play guitar. Well, have you ever played guitar? Well, I've never played guitar. Well, then you're probably not going to be good in the band. But like, if you can at least carry a tune and you've got some musicality and you like the kind of music we're trying to play and you're creative and you're not afraid to fall down and try some stuff, there's some cool things that can happen when you get a group of people together like that. You familiar with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones? Yep. Yep. There's a guy in that band that's key, super important to that band because he drives the motivation, the energy of that band, and he does not sing and he does not play an instrument. He just dances. Yep. That's his whole role. One of the few yep. bands that ever brought in someone that brought the heart and soul of it but couldn't technically contribute it in a way, but it made that band. That was the, the heartbeat of the band, and I thought that was a cool analogy. Um, I've been listening to a lot of jazz lately, mostly snarky puppy. Um, the most technically proficient uh, musicians you've ever seen. But the impressive part about it is there's a documentary on the making of their album uh, and the song Lingus. Um, they brought in a drummer that had never rehearsed the song. <laughs> A guy by, by the name of Darnell Lewis. Mm -hmm. Because their old drummer, they didn't work out, brought him in, flew him in, they gave him his charts, they talked about a few different parts, then they recorded the song Lingus live off the floor. Mm -hmm. Send you guys a link to watch this. When you watch the drummer, you got to remember it's the first time you ever played the song. <laughs> And that's about creating a level of communication and passion and energy, but paired with an incredible skill set and what can be accomplished. And that song went on to win Grammy. Um, but it's it's fascinating how sometimes you just have to let good people play. Yep. Versus, and this back to the music analogy, I, I struggle I struggle with a couple of my investors because they're more later stage you know public company institutional level investors and the best way i can describe them is like a, an incredibly well rehearsed orchestra of the best musicians in the world they can read the sheet music they know how to technically proficient at playing their instruments they are brilliant musicians in their own right but orchestral musician like orchestral music is about reproducing the original will of the composer. <clears throat> Being an entrepreneur is jazz. And it's hard to riff and build something unique and creative if you're always worried about the way the sheet music was written versus how the mood, right? How the mood and the uh, experience is growing it. And that's why I think about Darnell Lewis and and snarky puppy in the lingus recording because knowing knowing that he had never rehearsed it made it a hundred times more cool 
And so, that's, that's, so what, that's, that's what I hope to do in this business right now is I'll create the charts, but I'll create enough latitude around everyone to make an incredible contribution. Yeah. We got to be able to follow it, you know, start, finish, end, hit the brakes. But what happens in between, I want, I want everyone to, to bring their expertise and allow themselves to shine and contribute to the whole. It's not my piece of sheet music. But I think it's what our, you're describing- Our shared experience. You talked about it with investors, but I think this is the same thing with employees. I mean, you you need people that have an ability to imp, to just jam, right? Yeah. Like you can just you can just jam with each other. So you can sit yeah. down and somebody starts to you know the rhythm section starts with with a bass line and a beat, and people kind of get it and they start tapping their toes and they start to try stuff. Um, if you bring in people that have only ever been in the orchestra. And they need the and they need the music and they need the music for their particular part. They will struggle in a business that perhaps needs the garage band sort of improv y type yeah. folk to play, you know. So there's some struggle because they just don't know how to deal with it. And again, back to fit and being deliberate about that. I guess <clears throat> folks who haven't been there, done that, um, haven't been through those different evolutions, like it's a different type of musician, keep using that term that is capable of playing with that group. And, and you might need different musicians over time because ultimately you look at some big companies, those are the orchestras now. They're now an orchestra. They yeah. need a conductor. They need yeah. to have very set rehearsals. They need they sheet music. music. They need a play off of it. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And they do that and the hits that they keep cranking out you know, at Christmas time, it's Handel's Messiah because it's Handel's Messiah because yeah. the people coming to see, you know, want to hear Handel's Messiah and they don't want you messing around with it because that's what the... And they compare, they compare this Christmas as Handel's to last Christmas as Handel's. <laughs> right. Extra and critique that's what do. about uh, how, how, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's, a, that's another fascinating... Whereas I'm, I'm a more Christmas in New York, the Pokes. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Kind of Christmas album kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Or the Bonnie M Christmas mixed in now and again, or, you know. Exactly. Whatever. Exactly. Which going back to the Dutch was once uh, New Amsterdam. <laughs> well, there you go. There right. you go. <laughs> Guys, I got to go meet my kid. As well, you listen, should. Uh, yeah. Listen, this has been fantastic. Um, exactly the kind of conversation we wanted to have. Uh, rich, deep, great conversation. Super appreciate your time. We should, do it over, we should do it over beers and, and wings and maybe not record it next time. Yep, we'll do that. We gotta make it we gotta make that a, a commitment and a plan soon. I'll come for a drive. Okay. Or we'll come down. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, Scott. Okay, Take care. Day. See ya. Bye.